Mr. Hamm, a new question. Uh, this is a simple question, I suppose, but one that actually is fairly profound for all of us in our lives. What, if anything, would ever change your mind? Hmm. Well, the answer to that question is, I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, I can't prove it to you, but God has definitely shown me very clearly uh, through his word and uh, shown himself in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the word of God. I admit that that's where I start from. I can challenge people that uh, you can go and test that. You can make predictions based on that. You can check the prophecies in the Bible. You can check the statements uh, in Genesis. Uh, you can check that. Uh, and I did a little bit of that tonight. And I can't ultimately prove that to you. All I can do is to say to someone, look, if the Bible really is what it claims to be, if it really is the word of God and that's what it claims, then check it out. And the Bible says if you come to God believing that he is, he'll reveal himself to you. And you will know. As Christians, we can say we know. And so as far as the word of God is concerned, no. N no one's ever going to convince me that, uh, that the word of God I is not true. Since the 1920s, people and organizations who believe that the Bible demands a young earth have espoused that the flood of Noah is the agent that is most responsible for the stratigraphy of the earth, thereby positing that the earth does not need to be very old to account for what geologists observe. This position is known as flood geology. Flood geology relies on the premise of catastrophism, that rapid dramatic changes took place in response to a particular event or sequence of events. Is Genesis history opens by citing the eruption of Mount St. Helens as a local example of catastrophism and the level of change that can be caused by such an occurrence. This is a common citation by other young earth proponents as well. There's a similar thing in geology where you have these, these laminations that are formed, these horizontal laminations that they find in, in the Tapeat Sandstone in the Grand Canyon and other places. And they used to say those are laid down one year after the next, one after the next, you add them up millions of years. Say you can't trust a you know straightforward reading of Genesis. But you, can but you know put what that they found? The test, Jason. They found that that uh, when the Mount St. Helens eruption happened, it laid down many of those layers simultaneously. So you can get many many layers all at the same time. The takeaway with respect to Noah's flood is that flood geology interprets this event as being one in which the level of destruction and change was so powerful that the composition of Earth looked irreconcilably different after it took place. This perspective is repeated throughout is Genesis history. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. My understanding is the ocean floor upheaval occurred. Some type of magma or mm -hmm. earthquake propelled the oceans over the continent. So that's why we get uh, these marine fossils in these layers. Yes, and we have six months the waters prevailed upon the earth, another seven months or so for the water to subside. The 4,000 feet of strata probably represents the early and middle part of the global flood right here in Grand Canyon. We have other strata locally in this Grand Canyon region. That's called the Grand Staircase. We have about 10,000 feet, two miles thickness of strata on top of the Grand Canyon. Higher than where we are. Higher than where we are. And that represents the, the later stages of the flood and the retreat of the flood water. This surface was beveled by retreat of flood waters. And as the flood retreated into the newly formed ocean basins, then the continents probably uplifted and the ark, of course, was landed in the high country in the Middle East. Well, there are some people who say that that record is about a local flood. I believe it's a global flood and all the high hills or the whole heaven were covered, a universal statement, but that mountains have risen since then. And we shouldn't measure the depth of the floodwaters by the present mountains of the earth, which are largely created during the flood and after the flood. It seemed clear to me that a global flood would have transformed the earth quickly. The flood was not just soaking everything. This was radical, radical change, wasn't it? Yeah, if we're right about what we've understood so far, we got continents moving, smashing together, creating mountains. Mountains are rising to tens of thousands right. of feet. You've got water washing across entire continents. We're, we're ripping tens of uh, thousands of feet of sediment off of the old continents, 
and then depositing thousands of feet of sediment on top of them again. Yeah. It's, we're looking at it's, earthquakes of astonishing power. Yeah, where these pulses of water from the flood are moving over the continents, grabbing ecosystems or dragging marine ones up from, from deeper in the ocean and pulling them onto land. And as one gets deposited and the waves come back, they start pulling and piling additional stuff on top of that. And, and it's a graveyard on top of a graveyard on top of a graveyard. Oh. So looking at these things, you're saying, what is it that has the power? What is it that has the capacity to take the marine world and throw it on top mm -hmm. of the continents in such a violent and destructive manner? And, and the flood makes perfect sense for this. Keeping this understanding of the flood in mind, we make an interesting observation in Genesis chapter 2. Verses 8 through 14 describe the location of the Garden of Eden as being at the head of four rivers, the Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. The whereabouts of the Pishon and Gihon are unknown. However, the other two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, are well known and have been known since the beginnings of recorded human history. In fact, these two rivers still exist today in the same locations that they have for thousands of years. If the position of flood geology is correct in that the entire Earth's surface would have catastrophically been, quote, ripped up and redeposited in layers, how is it that these two rivers have been seemingly unaffected? Some flood geologists have attempted to deal with this problem by suggesting that the Tigris and Euphrates referred to in Genesis chapter 2 are actually different rivers than the ones we know of, both from today and from antiquity. Assuming mosaic authorship of Genesis, this account would have been written down around roughly 1400 BC, long after the events of the flood and their effects had transpired. If the Tigris and Euphrates of Moses' day were different rivers than the ones referred to in Genesis chapter 2 to locate Eden, what would be the point in referencing them? As their locations would be unknown to the original audience of Genesis, it would defeat the purpose to use them as locales if nobody knew where they were. There is no exegetical precedent for asserting that the Tigris and Euphrates of Genesis 2 are different river bodies than those after the flood. Only the assumption of flood geology that they must be different in order to substantiate the idea that the flood was powerful enough to reconstitute the Earth's sediment. It seemed clear to me that a global flood would have transformed the Earth quickly. You're using man's ideas to reinterpret the wood. The 4,000 feet of strata probably represents the early and middle part of the global flood right here in Grand Canyon. 10,000 feet, two miles thickness of strata on top of the Grand Canyon. Higher than where we are. Higher than where we are, and that represents the, the later stages of the flood and the retreat of the flood water. You're using man's ideas to reinterpret the wood. The present mountains of the earth, which are largely created during the flood and after the flood. You're using man's ideas to reinterpret the wood. The flood was not just soaking everything. This was radical, radical change, wasn't it? You're using man's ideas to reinterpret the wood. We got continents moving smashing together, creating mountains. Mountains are rising to tens of thousands of feet. You've got water washing across entire continents. We're, we're ripping tens of uh, thousands of feet of sediment off of the old continents and then depositing thousands of feet of sediment on top of them again. You're using man's ideas to reinterpret the wood. This criticism goes back to the earliest days of flood geology. Quote, on occasion, Price found himself defending not only the geological, but the scriptural validity of his flood geology. The amateur historian of science and prep school science teacher Edwin Tenney Brewster especially enjoyed pestering Price with questions about the compatibility of new catastrophism with the Old Testament. How, wondered Brewster, could the author of Genesis, writing about the antediluvian world after the deluge, refer to familiar geographical landmarks if, as Price claimed, the present-day topographical features of the region had resulted from the flood. If the Holy Land rested on stratified rocks deposited during the flood, one would expect the pre- and post-flood geography of the region to differ markedly. But Genesis refers to the same rivers and plains, the same wildernesses, the same mountains of Ararat that Noah saw before the Great Flood. Seen in this light, wrote Brewster, the Pricean hypothesis flatly contradicts the Bible. The reality is that the Bible's own testimony is that the flood did not have huge effects on the composition of Earth's surface in the ancient Near East. If it did, Moses would not be able to refer to the Tigris and Euphrates as locales for the Garden of Eden, because these rivers would have been destroyed and reconstituted by the flood. 
But if this is true, then how can the flood simultaneously be the cause for the creation of things like the Grand Canyon, the modern composition of Earth's stratigraphy, and even the arranging of the continents? The answer is that it cannot. Either flood geology is correct, or the Bible is correct. Reinterpreting scripture undermines the authority of scripture, and therefore it, it undermines all of scripture. Yeah, but and how? and beca because you're using man's ideas to reinterpret the word. This is not to deny the historical occurrence of the flood. Rather, it is to recognize that the flood cannot be used as a justification to account for the development of Earth's geological phenomena. By extension, then, the flood also cannot be used as a geological catch-all to date everything found in the geological and fossil records to a single catastrophic event. If you can play fast and loose with Genesis and say that it doesn't mean what it says, you know, when does it start meaning what it says? You know, when do you kick in? Genesis 3, 5, 9, Exodus, you know, where do you start saying, okay, now we can take it for what it says?